Herman Melville, 1852, Pierre, or the Ambiguities, a novel. Radio Rabonic TV, 1996, Pierre, a director movie. Leo's Praxis, 1996, Polar X, a movie. Quentin Tarantino, 2019, One Upon a Time in Hollywood, a movie.
dying. Now it gets me nervous. What? Did you have any thoughts about something? Would you want to go anywhere? Uh, I knew I wasn't going to go to the gas chamber because I hadn't done anything wrong. You scared of God? Sometimes I feel I'm scared to live. Living is what scares me. Dying is easy. Uh, how long have I been in jail? 34 years? 34 years, so um, I've been in jail, uh, prison, a uh, long time. The basic plot outline of Pierre, a young writer, Pierre Glendening, after discovering the existence of his half-sister, Isabel, initiates an incestuous relationship with her and renounces his fiancée, Lucy. These events lead Pierre's mother to renounce her son and disinherit him. Freed from his mother's influence, Pierre and Isabel relocate from the Glendening rural estate to New York City, where they live in poverty while Pierre attempts to make a living as a writer. In time, Lucy joins Pierre and Isabel in their communal living arrangements. Pierre's manuscript is rejected by his publishers as plagiarized and incoherent. After Pierre's cousin, who once had a sexual relationship with Pierre, and Lucy's brother confront Pierre to demand Lucy's return, Pierre shoots his cousin and then kills himself. Melville appears to be advocating an alternative orientation toward identity, based on contingent, rather than essential, properties of individuality. The essence lies in its denial of essence. The circular structure of this paradigm echoes Melville's sense that there is no foundational self upon which additional, contingent properties might rest. In foregrounding Pierre's anxieties about his subjective states being observed by others, Melville highlights his protagonist's inconsistent strategy to hide what in fact never really existed in the first place. It is precisely this stable system of signs and quality that Melville complicates in Pierre. Yet, Melville is up to something more than the typical Bildungsroman narrative. The painter of the first portrait, we are informed, surreptitiously captured the likeness of Pierre's father, who, having recently learned about phrenology, refused to pose for a portrait. It is the secret portrait that haunts Pierre. Phrenology, promising to decipher the complexities of the mind by way of careful observation of its alleged physical properties. When these two insist on having unchecked knowledge of his mental life, he flees their gaze. Refuses to have a daguerreotype of himself made for the public illustrates th. His depiction of Pierre's empty identity. Carax is drawing on cinema's ability to represent the nothing by foregrounding darkness in a manner that Melville cannot fully do with the apparatus of language. T. Conform to soft or hard-born aesthetics, thereby functioning to demonstrate that these are bodies, communicating mutely and intensely at the edge of bifurcating and dissolving identities, something of Melville's revolutionary rethinking of sexual desire is reined in by this all too straightforward sequence. While the attempt to draw out a delus and deterritorialization of the sexual intercourse, invoking the concept of the body without organs. Much more than cousinly attachment between Pierre and Glenn Stanley. Importantly, while Carax does depict Pierre's murder of Glenn and Isabel's suicide, he ends the film with the protagonist in police custody, shaken but still alive. In contrast, Melville's version indicates that Pierre dies as well. The novel, Del Banco feels, is ambivalent in dealing with the rather too loving supervision of his mother and his ardent sentiment for Glenn, the young man who is his cousin, with whom he explored the preliminary love friendship of boys. 15. The character of Pierre in the beginning of the novel and his suddenly becoming an author in later chapters. With its themes of sexual confusion and transgression it now seems fresh and urgent. 14. The book was the source for the 1999 French film Pola X, Pierre O.U. Les Ambiguites, directed by Léos Carax. Maurice Sendak, which present Pierre as a full-blown adolescent, muscular, ecstatic, desperate, devoted, and lonely, he is the man-child invincible. Carax is drawing on cinema's ability to represent the nothing by foregrounding darkness in a manner that Melville cannot fully do with the apparatus of language. 
Melville describes the much more than cousinly attachment between Pierre and Glenn Stanley 216. Importantly, while Carax does depict Pierre's murder of Glenn and Isabel's suicide, he ends the film with the protagonist in police custody, shaken but still alive. In contrast, Melville's version indicates that Pierre dies as well. You talking about dying? 
now. It gets me nervous. Why? Did you have any thoughts about something? Was you wanting to go anywhere? Uh, I knew I wasn't going to go to the gas chamber because I hadn't done anything wrong. You scared to die? Sometimes I feel I'm scared to live. Living is what scares me. Dying is easy. Uh, how long have I been in jail? 34 years? 34 years, so uh, I've been in jail, uh, prison, uh, a long time, all my life. I was raised up in here. So I understand jail, so I understand myself and I can deal with that. I set my cell and I do my number. But there's different colors on different people's backs doing different things. It's a different world. I love the world I live in too, just like Regan loves the world he lives in. I don't know pain. I have no depth of pain. I have no depth of suffering. I don't know ridicule since I was 10 years old. I've been in every reform school you got across the country and used to lay down and have to get my ass whipped till I couldn't walk. Tell me about some pain. Good pain, understand pain. Not bad. Pain's not bad, it's good. It teaches you things. It teaches you things. Like when you put your hand in fire, ow, you know not to do that again. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. Can't cope with the outside world. Do you have a recollection of that? And do uh, you if you make a and desperate plea out of something, man, there's no desperate plea out of it. I say, I can't you, handle I, I, the I, maniacs outside. I, Let me back in. Yeah, it would reflect. If you hold the negative up to the light, you don't see the light, you just see the negative. So I'm a reflection of your negative. There's no doubt about that. And I can handle that also. I've been handling, ain't I? I don't know, have you? Well, I've been up and down these damn hallways in and out of these nut wars for the last 10 years. You think you could follow that act? I'm playing for my life. You working for money. <laughs> Someday you're going to get out of here? <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> hmm. Get out of here. Where would I go now, see? What would you do if you got out of here? If I got out of here. What if they said they said to you tomorrow morning, Charles, hey, listen, you're free. I'd probably go out in front on the grass and sit down. The question is, should Manson ever go free? It's 10 years now since he and his three female accomplices, virtually robots under his control, were convicted of murder. Manson was also charged with two more mutilation murders. Ranch hand Donald Shea was beheaded, and musician Gary Heinemann had his ear cut off. Make dust, everything, terrible. One little guy, terrible, ooh. Boy, how insecure are we as human beings? Put all our fear on one little guy. Afraid to let him out. <laughs> he might break all the toys. <laughs> Why do you say little guy? <laughs> because I'm not the guy you're trying to make out of me. That's not me. I don't know what my way is. Everybody keeps telling me I got all these things. So I read the other day where I had magical powers, and I told everybody in the chapel, I said, zap, 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 zap. I said, where's my magical powers? <laughs> well, you can't read You can't believe what you read in the press. I can get no magical powers, mystical trips and all that kind of crap. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of silly. Yeah, I'm getting witches and devils and um, one guy come up and said, I, I heard you said you were Jesus. I said, uh, no, man, I ain't said nothing. He said, I'm glad. He said, I'm damn glad. I said, why? He said, I know you ain't him. I said, how do you know? He said, because I am. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> But I mean, you know, I've been in the network for 10 years, so you can't expect me to, uh, to rationally take this thing serious.